So as uh, you know, as um, as I've been introduced, the name is Nolan Wapner. I'm co-CIO at Anchor, but really my day job is I'm the fixed income person at Anchor. So I look at a lot of what's happening at the government. And obviously I'm responsible for all of our bond and fixed income portfolios. In terms of today, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit is relief programs. I actually came off a road show in February. You might have seen me where I was talking and the theme key starting theme to my presentation was actually the central banks are going to keep supplying us with, um, with quantitative easing, with stimulatory packages, and therefore it's going to soften the blows um, should volatility come. Um, certainly volatility has arrived and the central banks have definitely stepped up. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about what that means for US yields. I'm going to talk about what that, our perspective is on South African bonds. And finally, I'm going to end it off by chatting about the RAND. Jumping across to the US, and Pete had a slide up earlier which said that the US had stimulated by about $2 trillion. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a moving target today um, because the stimulus packages keep coming. But what I broadly want to do is take the stimulus packages and split them into two, two sort of categories. I want financial market support, and then support for your smaller operations, your smaller mom and pop shops, um, smaller enterprises. What I mean by financial market support is where the US Federal Reserve has basically stimulated some form of the bond market. So quantitative easing, they're buying government bonds. Um, the primary market um, corporate lending facility and actually their um, secondary market corporate lending facility, they are basically buying corporate bonds and corporate loans. You've got the term asset-backed security municipal lending facility. But basically, this is all stimulating the US capital markets. And total stimulus packages amount to about $3.7 trillion that have been injected into the U.S. via these mechanisms. In, in looking at the U.S., though, what's pr probably more important is the support for your smaller operations, your smaller enterprises. And there we've seen about $2.7 trillion now being injected into um, support programs for these, um, for these smaller enterprises. Uh, total of that is actually about 30% of US GDP, which is about 13% on my numbers of um, support for, for the smaller guys via um, aid packages, and then 18%, which is um, stimulating the bond markets. Um, South Africa can't afford a 30% stimulus package. It's just um, extraordinarily big. It would be about a trillion, um, trillion and a half rand. So instead, um, let's just look at it though. South Africa is not the US. And what I mean by that is South African corporates go when they want to borrow money to the bond market. US corporates, oh sorry, South African corporates go to banks. Um, US corporates will go to the bond market. So you've got a situation where the idea behind stimulating the US um, bond market is that they're giving ease of finance to their, to their corporates. In South Africa, stimulating our bond market is kind of senseless because actually no corporates are really borrowing in the bond market. We're all borrowing in the bank market. So instead, what South Africa has done is we've gone to the banks and there have been a number of pronouncements from the SA Reserve Bank in terms of um, making um, capital requirements less onerous, in terms of freeing up liquidity for banks, in terms of giving support to banks in terms of how they account for certain things, um, should they support, um, you know, support corporates and smaller enterprises to do this? So the U.S. spent 20% of their GDP giving um, support to to guys who are borrowing in the bond markets. South Africa, in conversely, has actually gone to the banking market, which is where our corporates borrow, and they've provided a similar sort of package actually. So from that perspective, it's very good. In terms of support for your um, for your smaller operations. Um, the U.S. has invested about 13%. I want to turn now to yesterday's announcements from, from the president. And what I've done is broken it into the top four rows of, um, of the table in front of you. So we had about 200 billion rand that was announced as a guarantee fund for loans and restructuring. Unfortunately, the announcements um, yesterday were probably a bit lacking in detail as it was. Well, and we'll wait for the um, finance minister to give, you, to give us more detail in a couple of days. But basically what it looks like is this is very similar to the U.S. CARES program, actually, whereby um, there's um, financing available for lending to corporates to um, enable them to pay wages, if that's necessary, to basically give them an aid package to get through the tough times that lie ahead. So we took that very, very positively. Interestingly, it looks like it's going to be structured similar to how the U.S. has structured these. 
So what you do is you get the central bank, the reserve bank, to put in some capital, maybe 20 billion rand. And against that, the banks will then lend additional money into this um, guarantee program to give you a total guarantee size of 200 billion. Most importantly there, there's no actual taxpayer money going in. It's, um, it's basically a bit of first um, last capital from the Reserve Bank, followed by um, lending from the major banks in South Africa. Secondly, what they announced is that they are reallocating expenditure from, from other areas, and they were silent as to who's going to lose out, unfortunately. But they did announce that they're going to invest um, about 130 billion of money into social grants and COVID expenditure. Some of the headline items that came up were it's about 50 billion rand for um, additional grants for those who are surviving on their grants. There's additional payroll protection. I think 350 rand per, per head was mentioned. Um, we had about 20 billion that's being directly allocated towards the COVID crisis to buying personal protective equipment, making sure we got hospital beds. There was about 20 billion for municipalities who are obviously coming under pressure as well. So overall, there was this expenditure reallocation. That's got a null effect on the budget because the expenditure was really already allocated and budgeted for, so we've just shifted it from one, one area to another. Unfortunately, it's also not that stimulatory. The government was going to spend 130 billion rand on the economy. It's still gonna spend 130 billion rand on the economy. However, it's just pointed in different directions now. There was then um, speak about a job security fund. Um, and the idea would be that we'd provide wage support and um, um, structures to provide job, job security. The total value of that was about 100 billion rand. And that was largely going to be funded by the UIF, the Unemployment Insurance Fund. So again, the important point is that it's not actually taxpayer funded and that we're leaning very heavily on the UIF at the moment. And then finally, the last bit of it was about 70 billion rands worth of um, stimulus. But what they're really doing is deferring your tax payment. So instead of your tax payment being due now, you potentially have six months grace to actually when you have to pay the receiver revenue, um, specifically for corporates and certain um, you know, um, well, corporate payments, I guess. Very important though, that's not a permanent benefit. So it's not like the US where the cash has just been paid into the taxpayer's bank account. You owe the taxpayer the, or the tax man the money. Instead of paying him February, you're now paying him in September, but you're still paying him. And you're actually still paying him in the same tax year because our tax year only ends in 28 Feb next year anyway. So from that perspective, it's actually also got a null impact on Treasury. Um, it just means their um, tax collections will be a little bit back-ended this year. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with um, two, two comments. Firstly, if I look at the cost per, to the taxpayer, it's null for all of those. So it's all been structured with a null cost to, um, to the fiscus, with a null cost for Tita. So he's actually, um, you know, very cleverly made sure that the Treasury isn't in a worse position from the stimulus. The second aspect of it is the guarantee fund is very beneficial. Um, the social grants is beneficial to those who receive it, but Money would have been spent in our economy anyway, probably not net positive for GDP. Job security fund, definitely positive for GDP. And the deferral of tax payments is more of a sort of cash flow management scheme, but it's not that um, supportive for GDP. So from that perspective, um, you know, the real GDP kicker is probably 300 billion of the 500 billion. And that's the other thing to bear in mind. I also have here for you two other, um, two other line items. The first one is we've had 2% of interest rate cuts since the um, crisis started. The value of that is to put about 80 billion Rand back into our consumers' pockets. So that in itself is actually very stimulatory. And then on top of that, um, the president yesterday alluded to turning towards the IMF um, to potentially fund in, um, some infrastructure that, um, that we can um, build roads, bridges, railways, et cetera. Um, let's, let's not talk about corruption for now. In that case, it's actually good investment in South Africa. And if we are able to uh, access very sort of generously priced, um, very low cost funding um, from the development agencies to do this, I think it makes an incredible amount of sense. Unfortunately, though, um, spending money on roads, bridges, et cetera, would be new, new money spent in South Africa. So it will be a liability for the fiscus. Um, it's actually the only part of what was announced yesterday that will cost um, National Treasury some money. And we estimate that this would probably increase the national debt levels by about 2%. We were probably going to hit about 73% debt to GDP. It's now 75 
Uh, total of all of those items I've got above, the 500 announced yesterday, and then the other two items that the president sort of mentioned but didn't really get into too much detail on, is about 650 billion rand. That's about 13, 14% of GDP. And actually, it's totally in line with what the US has done for its smaller enterprises. Um, so from that point of view, I think we actually stack up quite well. Um, it's also one of the biggest amounts um, announced by emerging markets. I think the other big amount in an emerging market is Peru, who've, um, through their pension scheme, um, released about 13% to, um, to the economies. So very, very positive on yesterday. The net outcome of that is we are actually super, um, super positive. We think it's, it's good for the RAND. We think it's good for South Africa's recovery. We expect that it'll give a little bit of a boost in the long run to, to our bonds, to our, um, to our RAND. And the other very important point to note of, after yesterday is, you know, there were talks about prescribed assets. The president didn't go there. There was talks about, um, <clears throat> you know, potentially printing money. The president didn't go there. So, you know, he went very mainstream, he went very conservative, and he totally avoided all of the, um, all of the populist um, measures that had been bandied about. So um, from that perspective, I think the market's also heaving a bit of a sigh of relief today. Let's talk about US bonds. And, you know, Pete, Pete had the chart up earlier, $2, two trillion dollars of support. I've said a few seconds ago we had... Um, um, you know, another four, tri on top of what Pete was talking about, we've had about $4 trillion of bond buying by the central bank in the state. And the interesting question I ask myself is, why are US bond rates not zero? The rest of the developed market is seeing zero or negative interest rates, and, that the, and yet the US bonds are stubbornly um, positive in terms of yield right now even with all of the stimulus, why? And what we are taking away from it is that the US bond market um, <clears throat> basically is saying that the US economy in the long run is probably going to recover best. It's probably going to recover fastest. And you know, in due course, once we've worked our way through this, the US um, GDP will continue to chug along at probably a trend growth rate of somewhere between one and a half and 1.75%. So the bond market is actually giving us quite positive messages at the moment. I'm going to flip across to the South African bond market now. And what, what you can see, uh, I'm going to explain this chart a little bit more slowly, is the jagged line is the yield on the South African R186 bond. It's the benchmark bond that everybody talks about in the market. You can see how the yield sort of chugged around in a rather wide range. And then through the COVID crisis, there was absolute pandemonium as South African bonds got hurt. After that, what, um, what I also chart and what Anchor does is we measure, you know, based on our models, what is the fair yield on the 186 bond? So what do we think it should be yielding? And you will see here that, um, that the fair yield is a lot more stable because economics is a slower moving, um, slower moving science, if you want. And the yield sort of drifts up, um, up and down over time, but over, lo over longer periods, it's actually quite stable as to what we think the fair yield is. And we've had to adjust for a bit of a downgrade. So the, yield, the fair yield has pushed up a bit. The thing is the foreign selling of South African bonds was so intense and it was such a knee jerk reaction that it pushed interest rates in South Africa on the bond market to way above their fair value. So what we, um, what we have been saying to clients is, look, for bond yields pushed way, way, way too high. At one stage, you can lend money to the South African government for five years and earn 12.5%. That, that was ridiculously attractive. And we, we've been saying to people, buy into bonds, buy into you know, bond funds at the moment. The, the opportunity set has, has come down a bit as bond yields have, have recovered. And we see um, bond yields right now are probably around about 9% actually. However, it is still well above our fair yield, and therefore we do, do still see further opportunity to invest in bond funds, which, will, you know, which, which are showing very attractive value and a very attractive um, forward interest rates at the moment. So you know, that speaks to what Peter Little was saying earlier in terms of our asset allocation. We still want to be overweight bonds. Um, over, um, at the moment, we see them as a very attractive, stable source of, of returns for clients. Finally, pulling it all together, I'm just going to talk about the RAND. South Africa buys into the PPP, um, Purchasing Power Parity Model, in terms of the RAND. We've looked at, um, looked at the PPP model. We publish it all the time and actually put one out on our website today. Um, and our fair value for the RAND at the moment is probably around 15 Rand to a dollar. 
you look at the red line, you can actually see how the RAND has actually moved over time. And you can see the spike in 2016, which was um, Nenegate time. You can see the 2002 crisis, and you can see um, today. The, the RAND is actually um, pushed when it was at 1935 to the most oversold it's been versus our PPP model in history, the most oversold ever. So from that point of view, we do think that the RAND is oversold. We do think it's got propensity to recover back to its fair value of 15. The point I want to make, though, is I don't think it's a snapback. And there are two reasons for that. Firstly, we need the volatility in the market from the crisis to die down. The RAND is not going to recover while um, the world is still in disarray. So, and I don't think the world's going to you know, heal itself to, um, tomorrow. It's going to take a while for people to come out of their houses, for spending to get started, et cetera. So for the next six months or so, it's very plausible in our minds that the RAND remains oversold. It might even set new records for how oversold it is. But if you're taking a longer term view, we do think that the um, likelihood is more um, heavily skewed towards the RAND recovering. The other point I'd make is that as we've cut interest rates, the sort of speed with which the RAND recovers will slow down. Um, we still think it'll recover. It's just not going to recover as fast. So, you know, in 2002, you might have seen a very strong snapback at times. Um, going forward, we think it might be more of a grind back um, stronger. However, the direction is probably stronger at some point in time.